Welcome. This is Dr. Michio Kaku, Professor of Theoretical Physics at the City College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. And this is Exploration. Every week in Exploration, we discuss the fascinating world of science and its impact on society. And today, leading off, we're going to summarize some of the top stories in science. Our lead story today concerns Earth Day, April 22nd, and also the March for Science in Washington, D.C. Two events, you don't want to miss them, two events that could have enormous impact because many people think that perhaps we're entering a crossroads, a crossroads for the future of the country, maybe even the planet itself. First of all, we have Earth Day. It was back in 1970. Back in 1970, that Earth Day got started. Since then, it's reached about a billion people and reached about 200 different countries. And we're going to see hundreds of them coming out for Earth Day this weekend. Not to mention a March for Science. Now, when was the last time you heard about a March for Science? Scientists usually don't march at all. We don't want to appear to be partisan. However, here is a non-partisan march. Whether you're Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, libertarian, what have you. If you're interested in science, if you're interested in nature, the way things really are, then you may want to come to Washington, D.C. for the March for Science. And so once again, this is a historic moment. Earth Day 2017 could be pivotal because what happens in this country is going to ripple out throughout the world. And then we're going to say a few things about the fifth extinction. Some people think that extinction cycles have happened in the past. One extinction cycle knocked out the dinosaurs. Another extension cycle wiped out the trilobites. Each of them dominated the Earth for millions of years. And some people think that maybe a fifth extinction is taking place, instigated by not a comet, not a meteor, but by you and me. In other words, some people think that we are the comet. And then I'm going to give some reasons why I believe there is not only global warming happening on the Earth, but that humans are responsible for much of it. So I'm going to go through some of the reasons why I think that global warming is real and it's being driven mainly by human society, human activity. And the next question is, what are we going to do about it? Well, what a mouthful. Once again, this weekend, it's Earth Day, 2017, April 22nd. Millions of people from around the world are going to be celebrating the Earth and asking what can they do to make sure that the Earth is pure, pristine for their children and their grandchildren. Well, first of all, as I said before, we have a march on Washington for science. When was the last time you heard the scientists were going to engage in political activity. I mean, give me a break. How many scientists are there in the United States? How many congressmen, how many congresswomen do we have that are scientists? But where does wealth come from anyway? Ultimately, all the wealth, all the tremendous prosperity that we see around us comes from science. But science comes in waves, and these waves can be very easily derailed. The first wave was steam power, and that gave us the Industrial Revolution. People didn't live long during feudalism. You were lucky to reach the age of 30. However, with the coming of the Industrial Revolution, we could relieve the burden of the working class, create riches that could propel our cities and our way of life. The next wave was the Electric Revolution. All of a sudden, we had electric appliances, All of a sudden, we had radio, television, telecommunications. The third wave was high tech with computers and lasers and all the stuff you see in your living room hooked up to the Internet. And some people think we're now entering the fourth wave, which is going to be artificial intelligence, biotech and nanotech. However, some people don't understand this and they want to kill the goose that laid the golden egg. For example, take a look at the H-1B visa as a simple example. The United States has one of the worst educational systems known to science. Our students score dead last 
I repeat, dead last, not just once, but practically 20 years straight in math and science. So how come our scientific establishment doesn't collapse? Well, even though we have a horrible high school system, our colleges are actually not so bad. And second of all, we have the H-1B, the so-called genius visa. If you are a Ph.D. in some foreign country, you can go right through customs, right through immigration to Silicon Valley, where you create value, you create wealth. These people don't take jobs away from Americans. They create entire industries. However, some people think that perhaps that's wrong. Perhaps these people, these scientists, will take jobs away from Americans. But look, there are many times no Americans with PhDs that can fill these jobs. And so we have to realize that once you restrict the immigration of top scientists into this country, you are also cutting off a source of wealth and prosperity. Also, the fifth extinction. As I said before, we've had extinction cycles on the planet Earth. For example, 99.9 plus percent of every life form that's walked the surface of the Earth has gone extinct. If you look at the fossil record, you say to yourself, where are these animals today? Only the tiniest fraction of the animals that existed millions of years ago are still alive. And we see the bones of the ones that didn't make it in museums. So that's the norm. The norm is extinction. And these extinction cycles take place. We've had four big ones so far. One of them wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Another one wiped out the chelobites even before that. But some people think that another comet or meteor has hit the Earth that is affecting biodiversity on this planet. And that comet or meteor is you and me. That is Homo sapiens. That's right, people. We are, in some sense, generating a new extinction cycle. Everywhere human activity goes, well, animal life gets paved over. Nesting sites, breeding sites get wiped out whenever developers come in. And perhaps we should do this. Do something about this, because after all, we are at the top of the food chain. We're at the top of the food chain, and it wouldn't take that much to knock us off our perch at the top of the food chain. Now, believe it or not, I used to be a so-called skeptic, a skeptic concerning global warming. I used to say to myself, come on, come on, give me a break. The Earth is so big and human activity is so small by comparison, then how can there possibly be global warming? So I said to myself, come on, give me a break. I mean, after all, human activity is tiny compared to what Mother Nature can create. Well, I'm no longer a skeptic. It turns out that one by one, in almost every measure, every metric you can devise, it shows that the Earth is heating up and humans have a lot to do with it. So let's now go through some of the reasons why I no longer am a skeptic when it comes to global warming. First of all, just take a look at the temperature. The temperature of outside has been increasing steadily for the last 50 years. 2016, last year, went down as the hottest year ever recorded in the history of science. The last decade went down as the hottest decade ever recorded in the history of science. So in other words, all the arrows are indicating up. We don't see a single arrow on average that indicates that the Earth is cooling down. The Earth is heating up, as we see by satellites, as we see by instruments that are dispersed around the world. Everybody agrees that the Earth is heating up. By the way, even the skeptics agree that the Earth is heating up. Where the disagreement could come from is where does it come from? Second, global swings are taking place as predicted. You see, global warming is not a uniform warming. Global warming in some sense is a misnomer. They should change it to global swings. When you have more energy sloshing around on the planet Earth, it doesn't give you a uniform heating of the planet. You get swings. In other words, droughts, forest fires, floods, snowstorms, heat spells, 
all taking place somewhere on the planet Earth at the same time. Forest fires caused because of the fact we have the lack of rain in other areas, droughts, and also floods because we have too much. We have too much water in other areas. And so you see that with global swings, we have a pattern. Have you noticed that we seem to have more 100-year floods, 100-year forest fires, 100-year droughts, 100-year snowstorms? We seem to be breaking records every year. And perhaps there's a reason for that. Number three, the length of the seasons like summer. If you are a farmer, you know that summer is no longer what it used to be. Summer is almost, on average, a week longer than normal. This means your planting cycle has to be changed or else, well, you go bankrupt. So farmers are some of the first people to notice that something bizarre is happening with the seasons. Summer is getting longer. Winter is getting shorter. And Mother Nature has also noticed it. Because after all, we have the expression, the early bird gets the worm. That implies that the cycles of the birds and the cycles of the insects are somehow synchronized. However, if the earth is heating up, it means that the natural cycle of animals is also being disrupted so that the early bird does not necessarily get the worm. So in other words, we're messing around with the cycles of Mother Nature. Number four. When you look at diseases, you realize that diseases are spreading north. Take a look at West Nile virus, which hit New York City a few years ago. You see, many of these diseases are being spread by mosquitoes. And mosquito larvae and eggs during wintertime, many of them get killed. As a consequence, mosquitoes cannot move northward very much because if they did, their eggs would freeze. However, now with global warming... Now the fact that cool areas are not so cool anymore, it means that malaria, it means that West Nile virus, it means that mosquito-borne diseases are slowly marching northward, which is something that demographers have noticed. Number five, sea level. Sea levels are rising. Now, we know, for example, that most of the sea level rise is not due to the melting of the poles at all. Most of the sea level rise is due to the fact that water expands when it gets warm. In fact, almost everything expands when it gets warm because what is warmth? Heat is nothing but atoms in motion. And when atoms go into motion, they take up more space. They expand. And that's why water expands, metal expands, almost everything expands when heated up. Now, water levels are rising at a very precise rate that is very measurable. If you go to the seashore, for example, you can see etched in rock, sea levels that took place many, many decades ago. And what we find is that sea levels are rising uniformly around the entire planet, not because of the melting of the poles, but because of the expansion of water, because water is heating up. And as a consequence of that, we are beginning to lose shoreline. For every vertical inch that you lose on a beach, you lose about 100 inches horizontally. So it means that a lot of our pristine beaches are beginning to wash away as a consequence of global warming. That's point number five. Oh, by the way, it also means that projections done by computer of what America will look like in 2050 and 2100 are not very pretty. Into the coming centuries, Florida is going to be reduced to a small stump. You're not going to see Miami Beach. You're not going to see Palm Beach. All of that's going to be pretty much underwater in the coming decades. Not to mention that Boston. If you look at old maps of Boston during the Revolutionary War years, you realize that the coastline of Boston was quite different because of landfill, which means that some of our great American cities will go underwater, including New Orleans. There are large parts of New Orleans that are actually under sea level, It's one of the unpleasant legacies that we inherited from the French, that when they settled into New Orleans, they settled into areas that were below sea level. So we're going to see many of our great cities go underwater. For example, just take a look at Venice. That's a simple example where you have to have gigantic locks 
and levees and dikes to prevent this great city from going under. In the future, it'll be New Orleans, Boston, San Francisco, New York. Just remember that roughly 50% of the population of the country lives near the ocean. And so this is something that's going to affect all of us. And we mentioned the poles. Let's talk about the poles. The North Pole is thinning at an alarming rate. The Nautilus submarine visited the North Pole back in the 1950s. Fifty years later, when we continue to visit the North Pole, we measure the thickness of the ice. And we find, uh uh-oh, a 50% drop in the thickness of the ice in the North Pole. In fact, at some points of the year, like in summertime, the North Pole itself is reduced to a puddle. There is no more ice on the North Pole at certain seasonal times of the year. Also, it means that all the glaciers are receding. We have photographs of glaciers taken by outdoors people, taken by satellites at different times. And when we put all these pictures together, we come with the startling conclusion that all the major glaciers on the planet Earth are receding. It was Hemingway who wrote the famous novel, The Snows of Kilimanjaro. And our descendants may wonder, well, gee, how come there's a novel called The Snows of Kilimanjaro when there are no snows in Kilimanjaro? And for that matter, Santa Claus comes from the North Pole. But kids may say, now, wait a minute. At certain times of the year, there is no North Pole. So where does Santa Claus glow during summertime? Where does he go? So we see all the glaciers receding. And the real bad news, the real bad news is the South Pole, which is much bigger than the North Pole. The South Polar region is beginning to break up. This is something that we thought, we scientists thought we would not see in our lifetime. And yet we're seeing it right before our eyes. Just this past December 2016, a gigantic crack emerged in the Larsen Ice Shelf Sea. Now, Larsen Ice Shelf A and B have already broken off. They're gone. However, Larsen Ice Shelf C is about the size of Delaware, and it's breaking off even as we speak. Sometime, perhaps in the coming days, weeks, or coming months, we will see a huge chunk of Antarctica break off, a piece about the size of Delaware. Now, will that cause sea level rise when the Larsen Ice Shelf Sea breaks off? The short answer is no. It's an ice shelf. That is, it sits in the water. Therefore, if it melts, it's not going to change sea level so much. However, however, behind Larsen Ice Shelf, we have different formations of ice that sit on land, ice sheets. And when the ice sheets begin to slide into the ocean, then you will see a sea level rise caused by the disintegration of the South Polar region. This is something that we have to look at very carefully. And so once again, in the coming days, weeks, months, I fully expect to have another announcement on exploration declaring that Larsen Ice Shelf C, the size of Delaware, has broken off the South Pole. And the question is, what's next? Also, looking at more tropical areas of the Earth, the coral reefs are dying out. You know, years ago, scientists began to notice something very strange. The coral reefs were turning white. We've never seen that before. They were turning white because they were dying off. And this is noticeable now by satellites, noticeable now by people who live in this area, The coral reefs are dying off, especially in areas like Australia. And that could have enormous consequences because the coral reefs give us stability in the ocean. And next, the polar vortex is beginning to wobble, which means that at wintertime, winters are becoming more and more unpredictable because global warming tends to destabilize the polar vortex. Now, let me explain. The polar vortex is like a gigantic hurricane sitting on top of the North Pole. Normally, it's pretty stable. 
The faster it spins, the more energy it has, the more stable it is. However, the energy of the polar vortex can be altered by altering the temperature and pressure inside and outside this hurricane. As global warming kicks in at the North Pole, it means that the inside of the hurricane has a temperature that is comparable to the temperature outside. Now, the larger the difference in temperature between the inside and the outside of this hurricane, the faster it spins and the more stable it is. The smaller the temperature difference between the inside and the outside, the slower the winds go and the more unstable it gets. Well, guess what's happening? Bingo. Analysis of the temperature shows that as the Earth heats up, the temperature difference between the inside and the outside of the polar vortex is getting smaller and smaller. Now, as the polar vortex wanders, it begins to hit the jet stream. And the jet stream, in turn, controls the path of the Arctic air that comes from Alaska and Canada, sweeps down the Midwest, and then goes out to Canada again. So, when the polar vortex begins to wander, because the temperature inside the hurricane is getting warmer and warmer, it means that the polar vortex wobbles, which in turn affects the jet stream, pushing it further south. And that's one of the reasons why we have these gigantic cold snaps coming out of nowhere. It's because of the fact that we have an instability in the polar vortex. And guess what? Some people think that the cold snap that we've been having, these irregular temperature flows, especially during wintertime, is a consequence of the polar vortex being destabilized by global warming. Now, let's take the devil's advocate position for the moment. Some skeptics say, bah, humbug. It's a natural cycle. The Earth is heating up anyway, and that's all you've picked up. And second, some people say they don't trust the computer programs. Well, let's address these points one by one. First of all, the skeptics now concede that the Earth, yes, is heating up, but they say it's a natural cycle rather than anything that humans have created. But you see, the Earth has been heating up for the last 10,000 years. 10,000 years ago, North America was under about a half a mile of ice. Therefore, it was really cold during the Ice Age. 10,000 years ago, the ice melted and civilization gets off the ground. 10,000 years from now, some people think there could be another Ice Age. And so we're between glaciations. And therefore, these are natural cycles. Well, yes and no. Yes, it is a natural cycle. But we have a spike a spike in the rise of temperature within the last 50 years. That's not part of the normal warming for the last 10,000 years. We're talking about a spike in temperature, a spike in carbon dioxide, taking place just during the Industrial Revolution, just within the last 50-plus years. That doesn't seem to be linked to any natural cycle at all. Not to mention the fact that carbon dioxide levels... And temperature levels go up and down like, like a roller coaster. Now, we know this because we have ice cores. That is, we go to Greenland, we go to the North Pole, we dig into the ice, and some of the ice was laid down in terms of a snowstorm thousands of years ago. We can now go back approximately 600,000 years into the past by simply drilling into the ice. And what, ha what do you find? Bingo. We find an exact correlation between carbon dioxide levels and temperature. When carbon dioxide levels go up, temperature goes up. When they go down, temperature goes down as well. Like two roller coasters. And so we have correlation there. Now, some people say that, well, yeah, but if you go back to the dinosaur age, it was quite warm during the dinosaur age. And so, yeah, sometimes we see the fact that the Earth does heat up. Well, yes, that's true. But you see, temperature heats up over a period of thousands of years. Here, we're seeing something that happens on a scale of 50 years, something that hasn't happened in memory. And science says that, well, it's probably human activity. And you can calculate 
using computer programs how much human activity contributes to the carbon dioxide. In fact, we can take these computer programs and run them backwards. That is, take the temperature today and run the videotape backwards and calculate what the weather must have been like in the past. And bingo, we find a correlation. So in other words, these computer programs are not perfect, but they're good enough to predict the past. Well, if you trust these to predict the past, where we do have concrete results, then we also think we can trust them in the future. Now, the critics, instead of doing their own computer programs, simply don't believe the computer programs of the scientists. Well, what can you say at that point? It's just hot air if it's just your personal opinion that the Earth is heating up or the Earth is not heating up. Scientists actually have something more than just idle speculation. So if the critics don't like these computer programs, they should run themselves. They should create their own computer programs proving their point of view. And then we have something to compare. Then we can analyze the computer programs of most climatologists versus the computer programs of the critics. However, the critics never, never run their own computer programs. Now, scientists, of course, are cautious people. They're, gonna, they're not going to be like Paul Revere and sound the alarm every time something happens. So scientists are rather cautious. However, they give a probability of their statements being correct. It turns out that almost 100% of the scientific community believe with 95% confidence, 95% confidence that A, the Earth is heating up, B, it is human activity, largely, which is driving it. Now, they don't say that with 100% confidence, but with about 95% confidence, you can say that the scientific community, using all the computer programs, believe that it is human activity driving global warming. And if you want more information about these things, come to Washington, D.C., the March for Science as well as Earth Day, April 22nd. Be part of history, because some people think that perhaps we're entering a turning point, not just in American history, but perhaps in world history as well. And so think about it. You may think about going to Washington, D.C. this weekend. Well, I'm afraid that's it for the first part of exploration. In the second part of exploration, we're going to bring on a pre-recorded interview with one of the world's leading environmentalists, Lester Brown, as he talks about the state of the planet. So stay with us for the second half of exploration as we bring on one of the world's leading environmentalists, Lester Brown, founder of the World Wise Institute and the Earth Policy Institute, talking about state of the earth on Earth Day. Welcome. Once again, this is Dr. Michio Kaku, Professor of Theoretical Physics at the City College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. And this is the second half of Exploration. In the first half of exploration, we mentioned that this weekend is Earth Day and the March for Science in Washington, D.C. And in the second half of exploration, we're going to bring on a pre-recorded interview with one of the world's leading environmentalists, Lester Brown. If you were to make a short list, a short list of the world's leading environmentalists, Lester Brown would be right there near the top. He's the founder of the World Wash Institute, an organization that acts as a clearinghouse for environmental information that presidents and prime ministers consult. And he has a book out called Plan B. What is Plan A? Well, Plan A is doing nothing. Plan B is a proactive account of what we should do. So check out his website. You can go to Earth Policy Institute and World Watch Institute two organizations that he helped to found, and you can see a collection of his latest books. For example, he's worried about population. He's worried about food. He's worried about how we're going to feed the hungry. Because, of course, what happens if food supplies begin to dwindle, if we have problems with 
poverty in different areas of the world. We're talking about political instability, which could boomerang back on us again. And so once again, our special guest today is Lester Brown, one of the world's leading environmentalists, founder of the World Wise Institute and the Earth Policy Institute. And we're talking about state of the world. Mr. Brown, can you tell us a little bit about the Earth Policy Institute, which you helped to found? Well, the, the Earth Policy Institute is, is a small uh, nonprofit research institute in Washington, D.C., um, that, uh, that I started, I guess, eight years ago now. And um, its its purpose is to um, is twofold. One is to give a sense of what a sustainable world would look like. And then second, um, kind of a roadmap on how we get from, from here to there. Um, everything that we do, <clears throat> including uh, Plan B, uh, the Plan B series now is uh, is on our website uh, uh, free of charge. Um, we 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 did Plan B, <clears throat> the first one was it um, I guess six years ago now, um, because Plan A, business as usual, is not working very well, and we wanted to give a sense of what what an alternative future might look like and and so we started the plan b series and then um i mean we 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 did plan b and then uh it became clear that things were were happening we needed to uh uh to update it with with new technologies and new developments new challenges and so forth and so now we've sort of fallen into the habit of of updating it every uh two years or um in the case of plan b 4.0 which is just coming out uh now um um in, in, in less than two years because things, things are happening, uh, so fast. But Plan B is, is a, um, uh, is a, is a broad-based, uh, plan that includes environmental issues like climate change and population growth. And it has four basic goals. One, stabilize climate. Two, stabilize population. Three, eradicate poverty. And I would point out that stabilizing population and eradicating poverty are, are closely related. And then the fourth is to restore the Earth's natural systems, its forests, grasslands, soils, fisheries, aquifers, and so forth. Well, that's really quite an agenda, but let's break it down one by one. First, first of all, it was Malthus who predicted hundreds of years ago that any society that exceeds its uh, food supply with an expanding population is going to face starvation. And there have been many dire predictions of a population bomb going back to the 1960s. Well, let's talk about this. First of all, food. We did have the Green Revolution, which helped to uh, tamp down some of the expectations of a population bomb. But are food harvests keeping up? You know, I was um, um, in 1970 when Norman Borlaug uh, got the Nobel Peace Prize for his work in developing the... Uh, the high yielding dwarf wheat. Um, I was asked to do the uh, the appreciation pieces they're called for for science, and I ended it by saying that uh, um, Norman Borlaug has made an enormous contribution to uh, to uh, doubling and tripling uh, wheat yields um, in various countries around the world. But if we don't get the breaks on population growth, his work will have been in vain. Let it not be so. That was that's how the article ended, and that was 1970. And what has happened since then, as as you know, is uh, world populations continue to grow. We've we've slowed the rate of growth from about two percent at that time to uh, 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 just over one percent today. But the number of people we're adding is is roughly the same or a bit more. Back then, we were adding maybe 70 million people a year. Now we're adding 80 million people a year. And these people are being added, almost all of them, in, in the lower-income countries, countries that are already pressing against the limits of their of their, their crop lands, their soils, and, and their, their water resources. Um, so we've, we've made a lot of progress on the food front, but it's been largely... Um, um, washed away by, by population growth. And what we're now seeing is a deterioration in the food situation, 
Um, we had gotten the number of hungry people in the world down to about 815 million in the mid-90s. And then uh, last year, it went up to uh, um, uh, 900 million, and, and this year it's gone past a billion. And the projections are now for the um, in the years ahead for food prices to go up and, and most likely the number of hungry people to uh, to increase. So it's not a um, it's not a happy situation in the sense that um, we've 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 made progress on the food front, but we've we've not made much progress on the on the population front. And if we can't get the breaks on population growth, if we can't accelerate the shift to smaller families, if we can't lower fertility, then rising death rates will eventually begin to check population growth. And, and that's what we're beginning to see in, in, a, in a few countries already. Okay, well, let's break it down. Food, water, population. First, food. Are food harvest peaking? Some people think that we had the Green Revolution, but the Green Revolution is sputtering in light of the population explosion. But what about food harvests? Well, the world grain harvest um, is still increasing. It's now um, a bit over 2 billion uh, tons per year. Um, the, the problem is it's not increasing fast enough. And what we're now beginning to see is a new set of trends uh, develop. I mean, from time to time, I go back, go back and look at earlier civilizations that declined and collapsed and, and, and read the latest analyses of um, the latest findings as to why and so forth. And more often than not, with the early civilizations like the Sumerians or the Mayans, it was the food supply. Uh, it was the weak link in their system. And I've long rejected that idea for our modern civilization. But I've now begun to realize that the environmental trends that are undermining the food prospect are all continuing. And whereas we have seen grain price surges um, from time to time over the last half century or so, they have been event-driven a poor harvest in the Soviet Union, a monsoon failure in India, or um, intense heat wave in the U.S. Corn Belt, for example. But what we're now seeing is a trend-driven tightening of world food supplies. And those trends include soil erosion, um, um, falling water tables, uh, rising temperature. Um, and, and the rising temperature not only directly affects crops, but it also melts the ice sheets which raise sea level. Um, and, and this is where the, the rice-growing river deltas of, of Asia are particularly vulnerable. And then we're seeing the melting of glaciers in the mountains, and that's important in the Himalayas and, and on the Tibetan Plateau because it's the ice melt from these glaciers that sustains the river systems, the major rivers of Asia, and the irrigation systems dependent on them during the dry season. And I don't think we've yet quite realized the, the, the dimensions of the threat to our future food security um, that's, that's now associated with, with ice melting alone. Okay, you mentioned the fact that grain harvests are not peaking, but they're only growing very slowly. What about seafood? Are we beginning to uh, clear out the oceans of sea life? Are we beginning to peak in terms of seafood production? Well, the world fish catch um, has not uh, increased, uh, uh, has not changed very much since 1990. Um, but a majority of the world's fisheries, I think FAO says 70%, um, are being fished either at or beyond capacity. Um, and the fish that we're catching are getting smaller and smaller as the larger fish, um, fish like tuna, for example, um, are fished out, and we're, we're sort of moving down to smaller fish, both in terms of species but also within species. There are not a, not a lot of large, mature adults reproducing in many of these fisheries, which is why they're declining and, uh, and collapsing. And we have just reached the point where fish farming is now uh, very close to um, uh, producing as much as... Um, as we catch in, in the in the oceans, um, but the the problem is that with fish farming, once you put fish in in ponds, um, you have to feed them, and what you feed them typically for carp in China, which is where most of the uh, the fish farming is, you feed them grain and soybean meal, 
and that puts more pressure on land resources. Um, so um, we've kind of reached the limits in oceans, and now the pressure um, for more more fish and, and seafood generally is shifting to fish farming and additional pressure on land and water resources. Now, you mentioned population several times. What is the current world population, and how is it going to grow by, let's say, mid-century and by the end of the century? What does the United Nations and other uh, demographers predict the population will look like in the coming decades? The well, world population now is about 6.7 billion, and it's projected to grow by mid-century using the medium UN uh, projections to uh, 9.2 billion, so about another 2.5 billion by mid-century. But my own sense is that those projections are not going to materialize because we're already seeing systems beginning to break down under the pressure of existing population. Let me just cite a, uh, some quick examples with water to, to illustrate that point. Um, Saudi Arabia, um, after the oil export embargo back in the 1970s, realized it would be vulnerable to a, a grain export embargo. So the Saudis began looking around for water and using their oil drilling technology. They found a fossil aquifer about a half mile down, and they have been pumping that to be self-sufficient in wheat. They've been self-sufficient in wheat for more than 20 years now. But last year, they announced that that aquifer was largely gone and that in each of the next eight years, they're going to reduce their wheat harvest by one-eighth. And by 2016, they would be out of the grain production business. Um, and, and their Canada-sized population, about 30 million, would be entirely dependent on grain imports. Now, Yemen, which is next door, has a somewhat different problem in that they have an aquifer that is rechargeable about 22 million people living in Yemen. But they're pumping at about four times the rate of recharge. So water tables are falling throughout the country. And even the capital now, many of the wells are going dry, and and they don't have enough water for people in the capital city of of Yemen. So Yemen has become um, sort of a hydrological basket case because it has uh, fast-disappearing water supplies as one of the most rapid population growth growth rates of any country uh, in the world, and it's one of the poorest of the Arab countries. So we're looking at, at actually the beginning of a, of a failing state in Yemen, and, and things are going to get much worse in the years ahead. Now, both Saudi Arabia and Yemen are relatively small, but uh, when you look at a country like India, the World Bank did a study there um, a few years ago pointing out that 15% of the people in India are fed with grain produced by over-pumping. Stated otherwise, 175 million Indians are being fed with irrigation water from wells that will be going dry. The comparable number for China is about 130 million. So between the two countries, there, there are three, 300 million people or so who are being fed with the unsustainable use of water. And this is going to become a reality um, uh, in the not too distant future, this this loss of irrigation water needed to to produce grain. Um, so this is this is the troubling thing about the water situation is that it's it's deteriorating in many countries at the same time and at an accelerating rate. Um, so when we when we look at at water shortages um, in key countries, we're really looking at food shortages. Now, some people say there's perhaps a glimmer of hope in the sense that as nations begin to urbanize, the birth rate goes down. It's harder to have children in an urban situation. And as they become middle class, they also tend to have less children. But that tendency is balanced against the fact that the population is booming in poor countries. So overall, do you think that the population is going to continue at a galloping rate, even with those demographic changes? The, um, the question in my mind is not whether we're going to see massive future increases in population, because I don't think we will. The question is, will we not see them because we get our act together and accelerate the shift to smaller families, 
or because we fail to, and rising mortality begins to take over, um, as it's beginning to in a few countries. Um, so this is um, this is the choice we're going to have to make, and we have. I think the the, the social cost of having neglected the population issue um, so much over the last few decades is. Um, I think the social costs are going to be very high. Now, some people say that it's one thing to cure diseases and to help the poor, but another thing to witness the expansion of the population where there are no jobs for these people, and uh, all these young people without jobs creates resentment. So what are your thoughts? Are we going to be able to have jobs for all the exploding population, or are we going to have to... Uh, find some way to rein in the populations even as medical care gets better? Well, there's no question but that population growth is going to slow substantially in the years ahead. And again, will it slow because we get our act together and accelerate the shift to smaller families or because we fail to do so and mortality rates uh, begin to rise in, in more and more countries? I mean, I was just thinking in recent days about sort of dilemma that the, many of the Muslim countries face. The key, as, as, as you know, to moving to smaller families is to increase female education. But in societies that are opposed to educating females, that, that doesn't work. And so they're sort of locked into continuing high fertility. And this is precisely the kind of problem that exists in, in Yemen, for example, um, or in Afghanistan. Um, and um, how we deal with that... Um, is going to be a key factor in the uh, um, in, in, in how things turn out on the population front. Now, let's talk about global warming. You referred to it a few times. Um, we have the recession of the glaciers. We're concerned about the stability of the North and the South Pole. What's happening with regards to global climate change? Well, it seems like almost every time you read a, uh, a new report on climate change, things are moving faster than we have had thought they would, and this is clearly the case with uh, with ice melting. Um, we're looking at the uh, uh, the melting of the Greenland ice sheet now. Um, it is melting. That's that's not a debatable point. And the melting is accelerating. And we know that uh, if the, if the entire thing were to uh, entire ice sheet were to melt, the sea level would rise 23 feet. Um, but we also know now that in the latest reports that during this century. Um, the, the scientists who a few years ago were saying that sea level could rise up to a foot and a half in the century are now saying it could be up to up to six feet. Even up to a one six meter, feet in the century, huh? It, yes. Um, even a one meter rise in sea level, three feet roughly, would cover half the rice land in Bangladesh. Um, and it would wreak havoc in the Mekong Delta where half of Vietnam's rice harvest is produced. Um, Vietnam is the world's second-ranking rice exporter. And there are another 20 rice-growing river deltas in Asia that would be directly affected by even a modest rise in sea level a few feet. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is the melting of the glaciers, the, the world's mountain glaciers, and the, the, the Global glacial, Glacier Monitoring Service in Switzerland now reported 18 consecutive years of shrinking mountain glaciers around the world. And that um, is, is a matter of concern, particularly in Asia, where um, it's the glaciers in the Himalayas and on the Tibet Plateau that sustain the major rivers like the Indus and the Ganges, the Yangtze and the Yellow uh, River during the, the dry season. And anything that disrupts um, the flow of those rivers and their irrigation systems will shrink the, the wheat and the rice harvests of countries like China and India. And we forget, or maybe some of us didn't even know, that China is the world's leading wheat producer. India is number two. The U.S. is number three. I think a lot of Americans think the U.S. is probably the leader. We're, we dominate exports, but we're not the largest producer by any means. And China and India totally dominate. World, the, the world rice harvest. So what happens to their harvests will affect uh, us directly. And, and I, I point out in Plan B 4.0 that the 
um, if the Chinese come into the world market for, for massive quantities of grain, as they already have done for, um, for soybeans, they're now importing 70% of their total soybean consumption. If they, they come into the world market for large quantities of grain, as I'm convinced they will, they will come to the United States because we totally dominate world grain exports. So what we're looking at, at is a fascinating sort of geopolitical situation where 1.3 billion Chinese with rapidly rising incomes begin to compete with us um, for our grain harvest, driving up our food prices. Now, historically, in a situation like that, we would have restricted grain exports. But China is our banker now. Every month, when the when the U.S. Treasury Department auctions off securities to cover our fiscal deficit, one of the big buyers, in some months the biggest buyer, are, are the Chinese. And so, um, like it or not, we're going to be sharing our grain harvest with uh, with with the Chinese on a scale that we probably can't can't even imagine at the moment. Okay. Now you mentioned six feet of sea level rise by the end of the century, perhaps. Of course, these are all projections. What's going to happen if that happens? I mean, are cities going to be underwater? Are we going to have to have dikes? Are mass migrations from the coastal areas? What impact will that have? Well, um, if sea level rises six feet, many of the world's coastal cities will be partly or almost totally inundated cities like London, Shanghai, um, Cairo, um, Miami, New Orleans, obviously. Um, and what we're looking at is scores of cities, uh, many of them very popular cities, um, uh, being affected by, by rising sea level and, and millions and millions of rising sea refugees. Now, what that will do in a country like the United States, for example, is it will create two real estate markets. One will be in the low-lying coastal regions where real estate prices will plummet and a second real estate market in the more in the interior of the country where real estate prices will soar as people try to move from coastal regions to the um, to the interior. And and it's a situation unlike any we've we've ever faced before. Um, but this is what global warming is all about. And I think we're having a hard time grasping the reality of what's happening and what will happen if we continue with business as usual or anything close to business as usual. Now let's say a few things about energy. Uh, some people say that one way to attack global warming is to change our dependence on fossil fuels. But, of course, fossil fuels energizes the entire economy. So could you give us a little snapshot of what's happening with wind power, solar power, and other forms of power, uh, perhaps the fuel cell battery, in terms of dealing with this energy situation? Well, one of the reasons that we um, uh, telescope the time or shorten the time between Plan B 3.0 and Plan B 4.0 is because things are happening so fast. When we were working on Plan B 3.0 two years ago, we could not imagine the the rate and the scale at which renewable energy sources um, are now being developed. And so we, we devoted uh, a chapter in Plan B 4.0 uh, entirely to this, this phenomenon. Um, we look at wind power, for example. Just consider the U.S. state of Texas. Texas has about 8,000 megawatts of wind energy now in in operation. They have another one or two megawatts under construction, but a whole bunch more um, in the development stage. Altogether, it totals over 50,000 megawatts of wind generating capacity. I mean, think 50 coal-fired power plants. This is this is huge. Um, we've never seen anything quite like it before. But well, we're moving pretty fast wind now. I mean, last year, for example, we added 8,400 megawatts of wind generating capacity. New coal capacity last year was 1,400 megawatts. So wind is just totally taking over in terms of growth now. Um, and, and in fact, some uh, coal plants are now closing. So things are beginning to change very fast. And as you know, we 
have enough harnessable wind energy in three states, North Dakota, Kansas, and Texas, to power uh, the entire U.S. economy. Um, so it's not a matter of lacking resources. We have the resources. But the country that's really building ahead of steam on the wind front now is China. Um, they have been doubling their wind generating capacity each year now for four years. They're latecomers to wind energy, but they are moving at an incredible pace. And sometime before the end of this year, within the next few months, the Chinese are going to, going to pass us in terms of new generating capacity being added, and they're going to go by us so fast that we may not even see them. I mean, they are now, the, the government has organized six mega wind farm complexes with generating capacities in each that will um, range from 10,000 megawatts to 30,000 megawatts. I mean, these are huge. Well, I'm afraid that's it for the exploration. It's Lester Brown, founder of the World Wise Institute and the Earth Policy Institute, talking about state of the earth on Earth Day.